We're at South by Southwest with none other than Ethan Hawke, the director of the upcoming docuseries, The Last Movie Stars, an intimate look at the lives and careers of icons Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. Ethan, you're a friendly face at this festival. No, I hope so. <laughs> Last time you were here, you were premiering Adopt a Highway, which was one of my personal favorites that year. How does it feel to be back and not only be back, but on the flip side of it, premiering as a director this time? I don't know. I was born in this city. My a nucleus of my professional career has been built around work with Richard Linkletter, who lives here. He started the Austin Film Society. It's been a part of my life um, for as long as I've cared about movies. The Paramount Theater is my favorite movie theater in America. And even sometimes when I'm making a movie, acting in it or directing, I kind of imagine myself sitting at the Paramount with all these people. Are they going to laugh? Is that cool? Is this too long? You know, is it right? You know, I, I, I place my imagination right there at the Paramount. So getting to work on a movie that actually celebrates movies at a festival that celebrates movies was not lost on me. It felt really special. So you were asked by the daughters of Paul and Joanne to participate in this project and, and direct it. Can you tell me a little bit about how that relationship began and what were some of their expectations on this project? What I said to them is I said, listen, I, I think I would want to do this, but if I'm going to find out that there's some giant thing I don't want to know, you, you know, I, I had this idea of who they were to me. That they both kind of were these North Stars of my profession about what it could look like that you could live a meaningful, substantive life, you could be a good citizen, you could have love, you could have family, and you could be a great artist. Most of the stories are about people self-destructing, people getting in their own way, or society brutalizing. You know, a lot of the stories of artists that get made are you usually have some drama in them, and the drama usually is around something hurtful and failure, and I was like, wouldn't it be great to make a documentary that showed people like a hero and I said to the daughters, I said, listen, if I can't do that, if like, I'm going to find out that these people were awful, <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to make it. Like, and they said, I promise the digger, the deeper you dig, the more you're going to be able to paint that portrait of a hero, of two heroes. And what was it about Paul and Joanne that just loomed so large for you and your imagination when you were starting to look at you know, their careers overall and their career arcs? You know, I wanted to be an actor and was studying acting and... They were just it. They were, at that moment in time, they were royalty. Here he was, you know, he'd been an icon for so long, starting in the 50s with Brando and James Dean, and he just won the Oscar for Color of Money. I mean, he, he'd just done the verdict, and she was running a theater company. She was at every play reading. They were a part of the fabric of New York, and what was beautiful about him is, yeah, he was a movie star, but she was like the actor's actor. And the fact that she loved him made him really cool. And the fact that he loved her made him not a phony Hollywood schmuck, you, you know? And the fact that they were, this is right around the time that Newman's Own was really taking off, which was kind of unheard I mean, it's still unheard of to take, a, there's actually a non-for-profit company in your supermarket. You know, imagine if McDonald's was non-for-profit. I mean, it's, it, nobody had done that before. A commercial company that gave 100% of what they made away. And they donated to my first theater company. Uh, and they were doing that with everybody. Dance companies, theater companies, you know, uh, people who were aspiring in the arts. They were really trying to pay it forward or give it back, however you want to phrase it. And so they just loomed so large in my brain of what the profession could be. It's amazing. Um, so like most meetings over the last two years, uh, this documentary opens up on Zoom. Yeah. A lot of your contemporary actors. Um, can you tell me a little bit about making that choice to open this documentary? Well, I really didn't want to do that. I hate Zoom. I'm so bored of Zoom. <laughs> I can't stand it. And like I, us all. Like us all. And what I started doing is I, I was asking actors to, to read these interviews that I'd had about Paul and Joanne that the family had given me. They'd given me... Basically, Paul was thinking about writing a memoir, and he had all his closest friends interviewed to help stir his memories, get their points of view. And so he, he, we had all these transcripts. I thought, oh God, I'll get somebody, I'll get my friends to, to read these, and we'll reenact them. So I'll get Bobby Cannavale to play Kazan. And, and, and so as I was Zooming with them, asking them to do it, and started talking about the documentary, the editor, 
and I started placing these Zoom calls in our rough cut as temporary placeholders. Well, this is where we need to get that information across. We started realizing that maybe we sh shouldn't avoid the truth of how this documentary was made, that it was made during the pandemic. It is kind of about the hist history of movies and we're in history right now. And if I really wanted to make a movie about one generation looking back on the other, maybe I should just tell the truth about where this generation is at right now. We're frozen in our rooms. And, and while I w I've spent a year avoiding doing this, I started realizing I thought it was the best architecture for the film. Sure. I feel like with the pandemic, it you know it gave us that moment to pause and, and as film buffs, like to revisit a lot of these yeah. classics. So I feel like that's in, in some ways it's a little serendipitous. It is a lot of people were doing that, watching old movies, reading old books, and and so my wife and I got to just you know watch a, a Newman Woodward Film Festival in our house through the pandemic, and like, ooh, that's a brilliant scene. We've got to put that moment in. Oh, that moment's exactly like their life, and that's what we did. That's our pandemic art. So Joanne's one of the last living legends of that Hollywood golden era. Um, do you feel that presence of history as you're putting this together? You do, you feel a huge responsibility. I mean, this woman was the first woman to ever star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame and the last living Oscar winner. I mean, the oldest living, not the last, there'll be more to come. Uh, that's a unique position. He's definitely, you know, a card carrying cinema luminary. Uh, and you do feel a heavy responsibility, especially as a student, an acting student. Like, I love this job. And I would love for young people to understand the seriousness with which that generation started and how movies have been evolving. Because it's changing now. Everything's changing. It always is. But understanding how we got here really helps, A, have humility, and B, understand that we're a part of an ancient craft, an ancient profession of storytelling. And when you see yourself in that context, your shoulders can get a little looser and you can have more fun. And simultaneously, you have humility to that you're a part of something much bigger than yourself. Sure. Well, these are screen icons, but what do you hope to illuminate in telling their story that people might, might not be aware of? That they're not icons while they're doing it. You know, they're just putting one foot in front of another. They don't know if it's gonna work out. They don't know that they're gonna be in a 50 year marriage. They're worried they might break up next year. You start seeing it through their eyes and you realize that, oh, their life is just as daily and full of insecurity and discomfort as our lives are. Sure. They're living through periods of history that whether it's the murder of MLK or whether it's the Vietnam War or whether it's the Cold War, all these things impacted their work the same way our lives are impacted by what's happening around us. Sure. Did you ever attempt to uh, kind of, I guess, model your career on Paul's career or even your screen <laughs> presence on Paul? He achieved a level of iconography that's just rare. I mean, that's kind of why I wanted Clooney to do his voice. There's a lot of like really good actors and there's very few like movie stars the way that Paul was a movie star. The way, and part of that had to do with the way television and entertainment was changing. I mean, it was global, television was just, you know, when you became a celebrity, when it, when you're like Tyrone Power or Clark Gable or something, there, it's a level of fame, but you still had privacy. And the world was exploding. You know, the Beatles were happening and uh, JFK, the whole, what it meant to be famous, you were now readily available everywhere. It was a different level of fame than the world had previously known. And that intersected with Paul's career that I think, I've always avoided that kind of celebrity. And it, it, it hit him full force. Sure. And uh, just kind of looking back at that, like you said, watching these these films over the pandemic, um, what were the ones that, that really affected you kind of early on in your career or as a young man? And what were the ones that going back and doing this rewatch now have really affected you as an adult? Well, when I was young, it was Hustler, HUD, Cool Hand Luke, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and The Sting, right? Those, those were like five right off the bat. That I mean, Cool Hand Luke changed my life when I saw it. I mean, I just, uh, I don't know, it was like a holy experience. I, um, but I felt that way in different ways about, you know, as a Texan, HUD is like, it's written by Larry McMurtry. It's like, it's the Texas movie. Um, and then revisiting them, I just couldn't believe Paul's sense of humor. Like in his later work, um, Slapshot, 
Judge Roy Bean and Buffalo Bill were three that I thought were like okay movies when I saw them when I was younger and I was like, oh, these are brilliant. It's, uh, brilliant movies. They're incendiary kind of punk Hollywood movies. I mean, uh, Slapshot is just irreverent as hell still. Amazing. Yeah. One of my favorites. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. You know, Thanks for having me. We're really excited to see uh, you know the, the other parts in this doc. And, uh, well, it's good. It. it gets better and better. Promise. Awesome.